Stony boys, how's it going? This is Alan Averill and this is Agitators Anonymous. Just a little bit of Dublinese there for you. This is Alan Averill. This is episode six of Agitators Anonymous. How are you doing? Good morning, good afternoon and good evening. A little bit of Dublin there for you right at the beginning. Just to settle the nerves. Anyway. So here we are, episode six. It feels like about 10 years already since I've begun this podcast. But it's actually really only been five or six weeks, I guess. You know, I've been doing one a week. And I have to admit, the motivation has been a bit lagging behind this week. The city has started to open up a little bit more. So that's at least something positive. But my motivation is a little bit lacking. So I'm not going to bore you and start going on about politics or the virus this week. What I'm going to do is, firstly, I have in the second half of this a special guest, which is Jarvis from Night Demon. Anybody who has seen them take Europe by storm, well, take most places, I guess, but particularly Europe by storm the last couple of years with their absolutely stellar heavy metal shows, knows that Jarvis is a man who likes to talk and who's got a burning ambition. And it just so happened that he ended up being someone that I spoke to. As I said before, I planned a few guests and Jarvis was more or less the first person who picked up the phone. They're going to come in over the next couple of weeks, a few more people. But yeah, so Jarvis from Night Demon. And it's an interesting discussion because we're a bit at odds over what we see as the future of the music industry. And it's very interesting to hear a, an optimistic perspective. You know, maybe I can get sometimes bogged down in my own um, negativity. I know. Can you imagine such a thing? Who knew? Um, but he has some very interesting observations, optimistic observations. And it's all with his usually usual machine gun rhetoric. If you know Jarvis, you know he's a man with a lot to say and I couldn't really steer the conversation uh, anywhere other than where Jarvis wants to talk. So there you go. So my cousin who I do April Man with, Gareth Averill, you will probably know him from making our DVD, um, helping record primordial videos, photographs, all sorts of stuff. He just said to me, why don't you talk about some of those old gigs? Because me and Jarvis spend a lot of time talking about gigs and about the lack of danger and the lack of um, spirit and heart almost in gigs sometimes nowadays. And he had a good point. It would be a really interesting sequitur or whatever you want to call it into Jarvis's conversation to discuss some of those old gigs and to discuss some of the antics, some of the things that we saw, some of the people that I met. Um, I say we as in the scene, as if it's like some sort of amorphous collective. Um, but every now and again, they poke themselves out of the woodwork and go, Alan, do you remember this from 1990 or 1989 or whatever, you know? And in the lead up to this, a very old friend, a very dear friend down in Australia who fled the coop uh, a few decades ago, sent me all the ticket stubs from all of these gigs that I'm about to talk about that I lost over the years. Uh, and it was really interesting looking back at some of those ticket stubs. So what I'm going to do is just talk a little bit about some of those old gigs, you know. I'm And I'll, if you're watching on YouTube, hopefully I'll be able to bring up some of the stubs on YouTube or whatever. If not, I'll post them to my Instagram, which is primordial underscore nemthiang if you want to follow me. Um... And it is www.patreon.com slash Alan Everwood, two capital A's. Anyway, so I'm a little bit too young for, let's say, the generation of 
85 to 87. Um, I started really going to gigs maybe about 1988. There was Metallica and Anthrax in 86, Testament, a very famous show by Dokken and Accept in 85, 86 that people still talk about. But in the early to mid 80s, there really wasn't an awful lot happening in Ireland. You have to really put it into perspective that Ireland was essentially a second world country. I often say this to people and don't really understand what I mean. But I think statistically Ireland had about the same growth during, let's say, from 1920 to 1970 as an awful lot of countries behind the Eastern Bloc, behind the um, Iron Curtain, even till 1980. Uh, we hemorrhaged young people. They left. I mean, there are more indigenous or let's call them um, diasporic Irish Italians or Irish Americans than there are Italian Americans. Did you Did you know that? Yeah, it's true. Anyway, so we've colonized the whole world in a rather unempirical fashion as is our want and subsequently an awful lot of young people were missing shall we say from the 70s and the 80s and I often wonder as to why Ireland never had what we could consider a 1960s countercultural revolution despite the fact that we're beside the UK but there is another podcast that definitely be done about why Ireland from the late 70s early 80s is just lacking like there's no Irish discharge there's no Irish misfits there's no Irish Iron Maiden there's not really any new British heavy metal happening here there's no Irish Slayer even on a non a really rudimentary simple level there's no Irish Joy Division there's no post-punk wave there's the Virgin Prunes but the reality is for some reason between 1978 and 1984 specifically with post-punk wave industrial music metal death metal, whatever. There's just little or nothing from Ireland. And so there's no classic shows that I can say, point back to and say, oh, then this show in 1983. As for our own shows, Ireland is, I used to subscribe to this website called The Boneyard, which is gone now, but it had hundreds of old albums that you could download from uh, countries, you know, really obscure heavy metal. And, uh, it was organized by country. And when you went back and you clicked on the country, you would say Uruguayan speed metal from 1985. And there'd be an album or two or Venezuelan or maybe not Venezuelan, but uh, lots of obscure South American stuff, whether it was Parabellum or, you know, just like heavy metal with Spanish lyrics or Portuguese lyrics. Anyway, when you clicked on Ireland, there was literally nothing. We have a pitiful compilation called Green Metal which is 87 or 88, and there's bands still playing Oroche de Vatawalia, and it's all very AOR, keyboardy. There's no devil in it. No devil. No studs, no aggression, no nails, no otherness. There's nothing at all, which is so bizarre considering that Ireland had all the, had a, all the ingredients um, to create countercultural music it had it had religious oppression it had um emigration had massive unemployment but there's no there is no irish agit anarcho um punk a few bands paranoid visions but there's really nothing you could point to and hang your hat on and go oh this is the irish master's hammer the irish mephisto the irish parabellum the irish sarcophago the irish whatever and it, it's it's fascinating to me because you could go walk into a music shop and buy instruments. And I know people who made their own instruments behind the Iron Curtain and made amps to be able to play heavy metal and risked beatings from the secret police and being put in isolation. You know, I mean, the stories that uh, Anton from Pentagram from Chile told me about their shows in the 1980s. I mean, they're playing thrash metal while under the regime of Pinochet, for example. Or behind the Iron Curtain when you talk to Attila about Tormentor and Hungary. And of course, the stories go on and on, as anybody who comes from a second or third world country knows. So for some reason, we're lacking the bands until the likes of ourselves, Primordial, Abaddon Incarnate, Kurokan, Minus Tirith, as they were then, um, Fifth Dominion, all those kind of as Morphosis came along. But there was an, a few thrash bands in the late 80s who did a few things, but... The reality is the mid 80s are pretty, of a, pretty much a barren kind of time in Ireland. I'll go back into that some other time, maybe with someone from Ireland as a guest to discuss 
why 78 to 84 is such a barren time for Irish countercultural music. I would offer the answer that maybe it's a mixture of migration where creative, intelligent people had left, that it was the influence of traditional music and the show bands, which hung largely over Irish society. The show bands were sort of like the Irish equivalent of, I'm not really even sure how to what to call them, big bands who would have toured the country playing famous songs by English and American singers. I'm trying to give a comparison of something that would make sense, but I don't know, maybe big band Irish Frank Sinatra style or something like this. And there's the influence of this still seemed to hang over Ireland into the late 70s, into the early 80s, when musically we should have been rebelling against this stuff. Um, no idea. It's a bit before my time, and I'm rambling now off in a completely different direction as to what I intended. So I'm not going to talk about Metallica and Danzig in 88 or Slayer and Nuclear Assault in 88, as realistically, I was sort of too young for them to really have a massive impression on me, other than the sight of James Hetfield singing Welcome Home Sanitarium is one of the first memories I have of going, that's what I want to do. That's what I want to do. I want to be on the other side of the stage. And to put it into perspective, trying to go to a gig in Dublin back then was like, was insane when I explain it to people now. If anybody who's read my small little piece in Jason from Misery Index's uh, book, myself and Paul from Primordial talked to him a bit about the violence, the street violence that surrounded going to a gig back then. And even he was just like, jaw dropped, like, what are you talking about? But yeah, ask anyone from Dublin in the scene from like 87 to about 93, and they will tell you it was absolutely insane. Ireland realistically was a second world country, I think. And the antagonism on the streets, you could very easily go into town, into the city centre on a Saturday, and there would be hundreds of metalheads hanging out around on the street corners, hundreds. And there would be street, there'd be running street battles with metalheads and let's just call them scumbags, but like townies, trackies, chavs, whatever you want to call them, up and down the street, like sticks out of skips, bricks, all sorts of stuff. And the violence would be, you know, just like running battles up and down the street. And going to a gig, you would be running the gamut of, it was like running an obstacle course to get to the gig. You know, I was I was pretty young, so I spent most of my time trying to avoid all of it. But it was everywhere. You could, you could be picked off like, uh, you know, the kind of lame animal from the herd or there's the youngest one or couldn't run. I used to go to punk gigs in the late 80s. No, let's say 1990, 1991. I met myself and a friend used to, I remember one gig having to jump out a window from the first floor onto a fire escape and being chased by a dozen punks across the city. And it was a kind of reckless kind of place. And anybody who remembers like the old Chinaman or something like this remembers the crazy places where gigs used to happen in Dublin in the late 80s, early 90s. There you go, Brie. Um, and <clears throat> it was a kind of reckless, lawless place. And just going to a gig, taking the train out to the suburbs where the gigs usually were, you were kind of like taking your teeth in your own hands, so to speak, you know. Anyway, I'm rambling. What am I talking about? I'm trying to say Dublin, late 80s, early 90s, was a kind of law unto itself. It's anybody who's gone out on a Saturday night in Glasgow or Belfast or Bradford or Leeds, and sometimes there's a whiff of, like, antagonism in the air. That's what Dublin kind of felt like most of the time. Um, you went out, anybody who um, went into town on a Saturday to just hang out, and there were, like, punks and goths and cureheads and smith's heads and you know every kind of counterculture you could imagine and they we all fought with the peak with the guys with tracksuits and just going up to the skate shop clive skate shop up in summer hill was like going up there when i used to hang out with you know teenage skate fans who were into minor threat and suicidal tendencies and all that kind of stuff um that was almost like running an obstacle course just to get there so with the scene set of how insane well, I mean, not insane, but hairy Dublin was. I think anybody who's listening to this who's from South America, Central America, Eastern Europe will 
understand what I'm talking about. But at the same time, it had an incredibly invigorating spirit. It had something indomitable about it. It had something um, absolutely reckless and dangerous, you know. Um, so what I'm going to do is go through five gigs that stick in my memory from when I'm a little bit older, maybe old enough to appreciate them a little bit more. Um, and I think they're probably going to be ones that you're maybe interested in hearing about. Well, let's hope. Five old shows, seminal shows, important shows that shaped our scene as we came along afterwards. And they weren't older bands who were playing. Like if you saw Metallica in 88, they'd already going, they were already going since 80. 81, 82, 83 on an album four. These are first or second album shows by bands who are really pretty influential, you know? Well, first one, Creator and Death, 1990. This is famous for a whole load of strange reasons, and that being that at the time, of course, Creator were on Coma of Souls. Personally, a record that seemed a little bit too polished to me. I was more into the pleasure to kill, even terrible certainty, kind of frenetic chaos of of creator. And around 1990, for the previous year or two, I'd been sort of, my attentions had been taken by death metal, by underground death metal, by tape trading. And creator wasn't really um, hitting the same spot as it used to be, which is inevitable, really. You know, they were becoming better as musicians, moving into this other place that Thrash was moving um, they were going, heading off into this other direction, uh, but still a force to be reckoned with in the fact that they were in the big venue, which I guess the top hat must have taken a thousand people or twelve hundred people, maybe or something like this. But the big pull was death. But this is the tour that Chuck didn't take part in. Um, so the story goes literally cancelled a week before or a day before the tour. And so you had Bill Andrews and Terry Butler, they came, no Rick Ross, uh, and no Chuck, or whoever was supposed to play. What? So 1990, yeah, spiritual healing. So it was the bizarre situation with the drum roadie singing and the guitar player who was the guitar tech, who was from a band called Rotting Corpse, but not Ripping Corpse. Of course, you know, when we talk to the guy, uh, you know, I think everyone made the mistake. Oh, Ripping Corpse, Dreaming with the Dead, which I'm pretty sure either had just come out or the demo for Ripping Corpse, which is actually a really, really great demo um, that had come out. So I can't remember who exactly who sang. I have a feeling someone told me it was somebody from Devastation, but I'm not sure about that. Whoever they were, they couldn't really do death metal vocals, if I remember correctly. Anyway, so... They came out and said, Chuck, at, Chuck is at home, wanking his dick off, blah, blah, blah. He doesn't give a fuck about you guys, blah, blah, blah. All this talking shit about him. Very, very strange situation. But the band was tight and they only played songs from Scream Bloody Gore. Just eight songs, Evil Dead, maybe one, I think, from Leprosy. I presume the stuff from Spiritual Healing was too difficult at the time to handle. You know, you had James Murphy ripping it up on that record and stuff. Very, very, very strange situation, which set a kind of antagonistic precedent in the crowd. And I remember people in the crowd giving Frank Blackfire a lot of, a lot of shit from the crowd, flinging coins at him and all sorts of stuff. Um, so Dublin in that anything that was seen as a posery or extravagant move, uh, people just hated it. You know, like. People don't believe me, but when KISS reformed to do their Psycho Circus World Tour, one of the only places that they didn't sell out and the gig got cancelled was Dublin. Now that says it's all, says its own thing about the state of rock music in 1994, at its, or six, whatever the fuck it was, at its lowest ebb. But Irish people just, they don't like showy. They certainly don't. And if you have exaggerated moves on the stage, then yeah, they weren't, they weren't going to resonate with that. People rather go and see DRI, you know. So this very strange gig, Creator and Death, and it was really odd, as it should have been Death's first big European tour. Um, Sepultura had just come over and laid waste to Europe with Sodom, who I'll speak about now in a minute. But this was Death's kind of like 
I, I know they'd played a few shows before that in 88. Um, I had a bootleg of one in Zandam or Zvola or something in Holland in 88. But this would have been their first big tour and I think maybe would have broken them into the thrash realm as there was a lot, still a lot of people showing up to see to see that, that, that gig at the time, you know, or that tour at the time. And the atmosphere was quite strange at the gig. But afterwards, I never forget the crowd just piling into the parking lot around Creator's bus and just literally heaving the bus back and forth. Creator, Creator, like moving the back bus back and forth. People jumping off the roof into the crowd of people outside it. The band just standing like obviously pretty freaked out at all these lunatics outside. People just circle pitting, just going insane, flags with Creator on it and all sorts of stuff. As I imagine, probably anybody who went to gigs in Poland, maybe in 90, would have experienced the same kind of thing. It was an electric atmosphere back then, whenever a band came for the first time, you know. So that's the first instance. And oddly enough, Dublin would have a kind of a half reckoning with Chuck, you know, that I'll talk about now in a moment. The next show that made a huge impression of us was Sepultura for Beneath the Remains. This was 1990. And Irish people had taken Sepultura really to their hearts because they were Brazilian, because to us it seemed like Brazilians somehow seemed more like we were, even though we didn't know really anything about it at the time. Of course, we knew Sarcophago and some of the Brazilian underground stuff from Cogamilo, we'd started to try and trade. It was impossible to get the records, but we got what we could, you know. Um, but for some reason, I suppose it makes sense if you're if you identify a second uh, world or third world that what Sepultura represented as breaking through kind of made Irish people proud. It may sound really quite strange, but we felt more kinship with Sepultura breaking through than we did for example, with hearing about a Swedish band or a German band. So again, Sepultura played in the bigger venue out in the Top Hat um, in a place called Dunleary, which is like a suburb of Dublin, maybe 45 minutes outside the city centre on the train. And again, packed, packed. And just Sepultura, no Sodom. We didn't get Sodom and Sepultura. This is early in 1990, I think. And if any of you have seen Under Siege by Sepultura live in Barcelona, which is arguably one of the best live metal shows ever captured. They were kind of at the peak of their powers there, but in 1990, they were absolutely bestial, like savage. It was absolutely frenetic. Um, you could tell they were about to take over the world and the reaction from the crowd was just off the dial, off the charts. And we all hung around afterwards. And what we used to do is we used to hang around too long and have to walk back from this suburb and I used to live on the other side of the city and we used to spend hours walking back along the train tracks in the middle of the night having done a Ferris Bueller and made like a fake body in the bed and climbed out the window and proper like 1980s TV show antic um, something like out of a Twisted Sister video or something like this you know and we used to I used to literally climb in the window at five in the morning having walked back all the way on the tracks and being asleep for an hour and then got up to go to school. But Sepultura were absolutely levelling. And I think at the time they were living on the floor of the Dynamo Club upstairs. They just, I, the story goes that they'd bought a ticket to come to Europe after schizophrenia but around the time Beneath the Remains um, and just headed for the Dynamo Club because it was the only place that they knew. And someone let them sleep in a room upstairs. You know, that'll show you the kind of intensity and intent that existed back then, that people were willing to sacrifice things like that. And this is some of the things that we talk about with Jarvis. I mean, it's it's clear that metal has lost an awful lot of its teeth. It's become so corporate, so anodyne and so sponsored. And people came, people became, they became tired of themselves, tired of the music they like, tired of going to see bands. That intensity, that virgin territory that exists right at the beginning of something, just like the first waves crashing on the shore, are always going to be the biggest ones to surf, or whatever you want to call it, if you were around at the time, you know. If, if Sepultura had supported Slayer around that time for Seasons of Mist, I, I mean, they would have 
they would have run them close if not run them over you know <clears throat> so that oddly enough brings me to what is my favorite show of this period and that's day aside in 1990 day aside it's hard to explain or to put into context how actually shocking day aside were in 1990 now you see them and yeah they you know it still has something but Day Aside in 1990 were just like the white knuckle ride, like the most base level extremity. I mean, even hearing that Amon demo for the first time and then Lunatic of God's Creation, it seemed so staggeringly brutal from, from, it was off the charts. It was an other level satanic death metal band that we'd only really traded demos for at the time. And even Morbid Angel, who, I mean, look, Alters of Madness, what can I say? But for some reason, Day Aside, Day Aside just had this incredible aura. And then the photos at the time covered in blood and the character that Benton was uh, playing the rock and roll villain to the to the nth degree captured captured the imagination. But the weird thing about this show was Day Aside was supposed to play with Cannibal Corpse and Messiah from Switzerland. Really good band. If you can if you don't know them, check out the first two Messiah EPs, Him to a Bremelin. An extreme cold weather, I think. Really, really good death metal. Um, very underrated. Anyway, and that excited me because when I saw their name on the list. And Cannibal Corpse, of course, for the first album, um, Eaten Back to Life, uh, which, even though a little bit cartoony for me, uh, I still put it on the odd time and really enjoy some of the some of the riffs. They're chunky. They're, I enjoy it. Anyway, I digress. Those bands had been stopped by customs, so it was just Day Aside, and it was six days or five days after Creator. And back then, having the money to go to two shows, which even only cost like six or seven pounds, which is like 10 euro less, was quite difficult for most people. Now, I remembered at the time managing to get like a, an, an extra five pounds for, I don't know, I can't remember what I did. I painted a house or something like this. And that enabled me to go and see Deicide. But Deicide was maybe five or six days later. It could have been less even. Um, and maybe had 150, 200. I mean, it always seems like more people when you're a kid. It might have only been 100, 120 people. But this, for me, was the greatest show of that period. This was possibly the most brutal, violent and aggressive show I've ever seen. And Deicide played an instrumental of... Um, Try Fixian because they had no other songs. So they only had a 35 minute album, or is it 33 and 40 seconds, something like this. So they just hung out with us in the street beforehand, Glenn Benton with the newly burnt inverted cross on his head. And of course, this was just manna from hell for all of us, you know, little teenage Satanists who were absorbing everything at the time that came out like this, you know. And Deicide's first album was. And still is, for me, arguably the greatest death metal album of all time. But Day Aside were, if any of you can find on YouTube, there's footage of them, like Maryland, 1991. But there's one show in, I think, Edinburgh in 1990, which is three days after this show, or Bradford. And it's so caustic, so aggressive. It's so brutal. Um, it's hardly, it's very difficult to put into words how absolutely brutal it was. This was lean, mean incredibly violent the crowd just went off and I never forget a guy we knew from the west of Ireland from some island or something real mad bastard country Irish guy I will never forget him running around behind the stage to the front and back in those days the security at gigs in Dublin used to always be like old uh, off duty policemen or people with like dodgy connections to terrorism and um to the, to the groups connected with terrorism and always dodgy dudes who would have no problem kicking your head in. And this guy just absolutely kicking one of these bouncers right in the head, in, right in front of me, teeth, blood everywhere. And the kids railing on this barrier and Glenn Benton just standing there watching this 100, 120, 150 kids going off at these two or three bouncers. And they left, as my memory serves, they left. The barrier was broken. They just went, forget it. And... I remember Glenn Benton saying, you've got to give these guys something to do. There was like two ambulance men who were the only people left at the side of the stage. And the carnage 
the carnage that it erupted for the next couple of songs was off the charts. Um, you know, of course, take my memory with a tiny grain of salt, but the fact is my memory is pretty clear for most of these shows because I wasn't, we didn't have the money to drink. So we weren't like getting wasted and going to the show. We were skipping school and going and standing around outside the venue with our CDs or shirts or whatever, and hoping to meet the band. We didn't, um, we didn't have the money to drink. Like, of course, there were kids always sniffing glue and huffing paint and stuff like that. That's the sign of the second world right there when there's kids in the queue for the gig um, breathing in paint, you know. Welcome to Dublin 1990. <laughs> um, but we weren't getting wasted and going to the gig. So our memory of everything is pretty on the money. But Deicide 1990 is, for me, the top, the, 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 the apex of the gigs at that time, you know. That is, Deicide is the most influential gig from that time. And maybe only, it's one of those gigs that people talk about and go, oh, remember Deicide? And you think to yourself, hang on, was everyone at this gig? It seems implausible. Maybe I contradicted myself just there and said that this is the Sex Pistols 1978 gig, whatever, anyway. Yeah, Deicide, absolutely lethal. This will bring us then to death in 1992 for human. Um, well, no, actually, I'll tell you what. Before that, Morbid Angel and Unleashed for Blessed Are the Sick. Um, and my friend Anders from Unleashed got, yeah, I think he was 16 or 17 and was not allowed into the country with Unleashed. So Johnny Hedlund played the drums. Um, in Belfast, Pete Sandoval played the drums. But in Dublin, Johnny Hedlund played the drums for the one and only time, I think, since Unleashed's demo, maybe even. And they played with two guitar players out front and he sang and played the drums, having sound checked all day, which is quite insane when you think about it, you know. But Morbid Angel was a completely different prospect for Blessed Sick. We'd never really seen a band with like backdrops and like moving lights through the side fills. And David Vincent, of course, in full on codpiece leather trousers even just like oh my god look there's a you know seeing a band member in all the garb that we'd only ever seen in pictures just seemed somehow exciting you know but Morbid Angel in 1901 was a different kind of imperious and the rest of Europe got Sadus for that tour which sadly we did not get so this bleed this rings me to where, where am I now how many have I done well let's just talk about this one because I can see the ticket in front of me Massacre Morgoth and Immolation even though it says devastation on the ticket, it was immolation. And I mention this particularly because this was a gig where there always used to be a gang of maybe 10, 15, 20 to 30 guys who would hang around at the edge of the street and basically like steal tickets off kids, um, bash kids up, you know, st steal their runners. Yeah, you used to get your like your your... Your runners take your sneakers, your whatever, taken off you. you they take T-shirts off kids, um, all sorts of stuff. And this was one of the first times I ever remember I was writing to Mark Grew from Morgoth and he came out to say hello and he saw what was going on. This like pitched battle in the middle of the street. And he was just like, what the f is going on? And we just had to explain to him like, yeah, this happens like literally every time, every, not only every Saturday, but like every gig. And there were kids, you know, getting their runners taken off them and then being sold back to them. Lads would come up from the country and then you'd see them in sit in, sitting in McDonald's after the show, faces covered in blood uh, with no shoes on and no top on. They'd have had their shoes and their tops robbed off them. And I don't exaggerate. And the police would just wander by and go, yeah, whatever, lads, you know. But this is one of the first gigs where um, this dude from Morgoth, he called the police on the guys who were beating everybody up. And I couldn't, at the stage, at that time, I couldn't stand near him because if I was associated with the police coming over and seeing, speaking to them, you would have got your head absolutely kicked in. And we'd never seen a band play as fast as Immolation, as brutal as that. It was, the sound of Immolation in 1990 still sticks in my head, or was it 91? They were so brutal and so fast. And this super technical style of death metal is not what Morbid Angel and Deicide were doing. Massacre, of course, was Massacre. Morgoth was optically super impressive for synchronized banging blonde heads. They won the day for most people, but it was Immolation who we went to see. And we were just staggered 
that a band could actually play that fast and that brutal and that technically. And still to this day, I think over pound for pound, Immolation is probably still arguably the greatest death metal band of all time and still live, taking no prisoners, still really great. Have I done five? Is that five or is it four? Anyway, I got to talk about the next one because it's really pretty fascinating. It's death in 1992. Um, and this is a really bizarre situation. The death were supposed to play two days in 19, early 1992 for Human. Um, and the second night got cancelled. But rather than refund people, everyone who had a ticket for the second night just came on the first night. So the Sunday people just came on Saturday. And the venue back then, pro I would like to see pictures of it empty now. But at the time, I think it was four or five hundred people only. But death, they just squeezed everyone in and... Um, it was death and loud blast. We didn't get pestilence. A lot of people were pretty upset with that, but we got loud blast. Who split with aggressor license to thrash was something I was pre pretty into back in eighty nine or whatever. Um, but death arrived late. They missed the ferry, which very often happened happened with bands um, when there was bad weather between in the uh, Irish Sea. <clears throat> um, and I remember just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of kids queuing up outside and it was one of the first gigs where the people in the crowd started to kind of gang up in little groups and fight with the dudes in the middle of the street and but everything stopped when the tour bus literally pulled around the corner and Chuck was literally at the front of the tour bus watching all the kids as he came around the corner and everybody just went crazy of course but it, they were late so Death only played eight songs and it was really really I mean, they were brilliant, but it was really, really strange in that they were all... Chuck was wearing his Blondie T-shirt, just like stared out over the crowd, didn't headbang, no real interaction, didn't talk to the crowd. And I'll never forget in the first couple of songs, a kid jumping off the amps at the side or the PA at the side, and he came right in front of me, like maybe a couple of feet in front of me, straight feet first, straight into the crowd and his foot went, well, his leg went through the floor, through, made a hole in the floor, like he broke his leg right in front of me, went straight through the floor and three or four lads had to stand around the hole in the floor with their arms linked, just beating the head in, heads in of anybody who came near the hole in the floor while the whole crowd just swirled around them. And they had to like guard this hole in the floor. It was absolutely insane, considering how overpacked the gig was. When Chuck died, people asked me if I ever met him, and I only ever said, "Well, I only ever met him once, and it was after that gig. We were about seventeen, and we were talking to him about Fate's Warning, I think, or something like this, Queensrÿche maybe." And he told us he didn't listen to death metal and this, that, and the other. And I never forget this girl, kind of drunk, came up to us and came up to him and started complaining to him that they only played eight songs and I never forget he said you bitch change your tampon to her and we were like 17 years old going oh my god did he just say that kind of thing and of course my memory of it is I don't know whether it was done in a sarcastic or cynical way or what kind of way but when I was asked for any memories of him when he died I said well I have one but I'm not sure you want to <laughs> I'm not sure you want that memory um, to put it into perspective, David Vincent was cooler. That's, you know, that's what we'll say. <laughs> it's very interesting because in the early 80s, Ireland got nothing. We didn't really get anything. And that, I, that was before my time. The mid 80s, we got a few shows. There was people talk about Anthrax and Metallica in 86 and Testament and stuff, like I said. But we only really started to get some of these seminal shows, let's say from about 89 to about 93. There's other ones from the period Carcass, of course, Bolt Thrower in 1990 for Realm of Chaos, which was, I don't know, maybe it was not Realm of Chaos. It was War Master. I apologize. 1991, I guess. Maybe it was 1990. I can't remember. Anyway, Bolt Thrower got stopped because it ran over time. They only played seven songs, but we saw World Eater into Cenotaph, possibly the heaviest 10 minutes you might ever see to see Bolt Thrower in 1990, waging war through those two songs back to back. But there was loads and loads of seminal shows that looking back, I was really influenced by. We were inspired by going to see all those bands and they all hung out and chatted with everybody after the show or before the show. We, you know, Glenn Benton, David Vincent, Chuck Schildner, Ross Dolan, they all came out and said hello. And it's really strange now when I, 
see younger bands sometimes we play with and they don't want to they just want to sit in the backstage and play games or sit on their phone or whatever you know that's the least of the things I could compare now to then but the feeling of recklessness and being genuinely part of something in its ascendancy when death metal was just it was first taken over first touring um, it was absolutely magical and the shows were fearless and reckless and violent and aggressive and people really lived for not only the recklessness and the extremity of it in a way I prefer the old Dublin of 88 to 92 because people didn't have much and if they did well if they didn't fight over it at least they shared it and there was a feeling of joy that came across people really a sort of violent kind of joy you know anyway anyway ramble on ramble on right I'm rambling I'm rambling anyway so blah 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 fuck the virus etc etc um, I get it so I just wanted to kind of put a rambling story together that was maybe a bit more interesting and a bit more exciting than biometric passports, blah, blah, blah. So without further ado, here's an interview with somebody, one of my favourite people on the planet. It's Jarvis from Night Demon. And he's not a guy I know from the, the olden days. He is a new friend, which is quite incredible for a middle-aged man to make new friend, you know. Indeed. Right, here we go. Jarvis from Night Demon. Get it into you. Then, yeah, I mean, as musicians, um, we're going to be like the last out of the gate if this... Uh, we're the last out of the gate as far as the how society gets together again, yes. Yeah. But, you know, like, that also leaves us last... That also leaves us last in travel, you know? Yeah. So, so we don't have to fight the fight on the front lines, so to speak, first. You know, right. Some business businessmen will have to do that before entertainers, you know, yeah. before entertainers and before casual travelers. They're the ones that are going to have to deal with that first. So, you know, it, it, the, the like I said, you know, like or like you said, so we're, we're the last to experience work. You know, yeah, yeah. We're the last, the last experience travel. So, <clears throat> I mean, look, like. I guess, I guess, you know, if, I, if I'm going to end up being forced to do it, I'm going to end up being forced to do it. Mm. But, but I guess that's just a bridge I'll have to cross when, when that happens, you know? Yeah. Uh, but I, I'm definitely not a fan. Uh, I mean, I'll be one of the last ones. I'll just say that. You yeah. Know? I will, I will give it in the herd mentality eventually at times. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like if it, if it, you know, if it affects my, you know, my, my, I, I just got to weigh out what's more important sometimes, you know? Yeah. Like, well, well, I mean, it's clear that, I mean, this is really, I'm not going to say it's like an open prison because it's not really, because when I consider that things that our ancestors did and that and the other, but it, what it is, is a life within very strict parameters that has no adventure, has nothing of the other to it. And I mean, especially. Oh, fuck. oh no way. Yeah. But especially as I'm yeah. just, what I'm curious about it is though, is like I could see comedy coming back, as in distance tables with comedy, maybe theater, but gigs as we knew it. I'm 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 curious. Is no, that going to be allowed? I, you know. Well, I mean, you got to understand this. Even comedy, comedy is meant to be in a small club. And yeah, there's already true. a shortage of those places, so that's not going to happen. You know, yeah. like I see it happening virally, see, but that's fine. That you can you can that <clears> translates from the personal audience to the screen very well. Yeah. Live music does not. No, it's, you know, it's, like it, it's everybody's, all, everybody's waiting for the night demon live stream. And I'm like, dude, that's never going to happen. It's like, awful. Like, it, a little part of me dies every time I see one. What we do, especially, you know, yeah. like, oh, it's no. just like, no, sorry. You know, it, even frost and fire, you know, we've never live streamed the festival. We've had many people ask and I'm like, no, if, if you're not there, you're nowhere. Yeah. Yeah. Like, you know, like, like it's it's never a good representation of what's really <clears throat> happening, and I think the whole the whole that whole fan streaming thing on YouTube has just cheapened everything yeah. so much. You know, I mean, I I, um, I said it in the just before in the general opening to the podcast. Um, I was being you know flippant, but um, a little part of me, a little that belongs to Lemmy and rock and roll, just dies every time I get an invite to another <laughs> live stream. We <laughs> it's just it this is i mean if if this is rock and roll it's going to be left in the hands of gamers and tech death metal nah, sweet nah, picking nah. nerds and dude look look you know i'm more than 
I'm more than will. I'm the last guy that's going to get the microchip, but I'm the first guy that you'll see set up an underground show. You yeah. Know? Like, and if it has to be literally under the ground, I'll do it. You know. <laughs> so like, that, that's the thing. I I don't. And and look at people that don't want to come. They're they're more than welcome not to. I'm not going to do that right now. I'm still going to wait this thing out. I don't want to be the guy that's like. You know, you don't want to be the pastor that gets bitten by the snake. You no, know, you no. don't. And like, and even though I'm, I'm more than fifty percent convinced that this thing's being blown way out of proportion. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. There's a, there's a good enough part chunk of me that I don't look. I don't have anything else to do. like. I'm not, I'm not pressed to go out and do it right now. So like, mm. I, I'm fine just kind of waiting back on the <laughs> sidelines and yeah. and seeing what's gonna happen. You know. So so. Uh, but but listen, I, I've I had a vision of you know where where I am here in Southern California. There's a we have a studio and we have a we have two warehouses where we have oh, yeah. Sirith Uncle and Night Demon headquarters. There's a big industrial part around here, right? So the economy was already collapsing before this, and there's a lot of factories around here that are empty. Yeah. And you know the way I see it is just I see like you know hey maybe I'll rent one of those warehouses a place that you could fit three four thousand people in and yeah. just have a, a smaller show where there's four hundred three four hundred people yeah. you know it's like social distancing is gonna sound like crap in there but it's yeah. like I I see that being a thing but a fr- even that it's just like, it's weird uh, isn't it a friend of mine said to me how, how are people gonna go to the bathroom like, yeah what are the rules with that yeah so I did see there was a there was a social distancing. Uh, there is a concert in the U.S. that's happening next week. It's a, a social distancing concert at a really big outdoor amphitheater. Oh yeah. So they're cutting the capacity, you know, to one tenth or one twentieth or whatever it is. So I like to see that it's it, that it's happening. Like, yeah. I, I think the setup is lame, but just but it's not my concert, so I don't care. Like, it's just it's I like to see that things are moving in that direction. I like to know for sh- like. It's a fact that people are going to see another live band play in a concert venue. That that's a fact. That's awesome. You know. <laughs> yeah. Because <clears throat> dude, this thing happened so fast. I don't think any. I don't think it's even hit any of us yet. I don't think the reality really has fully one hundred percent. It's no. just like our brains can only handle incrementally so much change. Yeah. That when stuff like this happens, we're kind of just like. Ooh. And especially you as know? we're having to deal with it remotely and in relative isolation, you know. It yeah, kind of it compounds that yeah it compounds the whole thing, but it. But again, I, listen, listen. There, with the media and with the government, there are paid professionals that deal with the psychology of how new how how to tell people things, and they are purposely telling people these things to to strike fear in them, to be able to control them, mm. and you know the situation. It's just it's so crazy. I mean, even like I I'll bring it back to this, and nobody's brought this up. The whole social distancing thing, you know, it's it, physical distancing is what we need. It's such it's the same concept, but it's got such a deeper psychological That's true. subconscious meaning. Yeah. Know? Social distancing is a it, it's a somehow seems like more of an authoritarian measure than or even yes, a, and, even the language yes, is more the draconian thing that we could do as human beings is to socialize right now. Mm. That's the healthiest thing we could do even yeah. with the pandemic. You can keep your physical distance if science proves that that will keep you from getting sick. But social distancing is the last thing we should be doing right now. Yeah. That's what creates insanity, that's what creates suicide, crime, murder, everything. Well, yeah, know? I mean it's we're going to be we're, what how we come out of this is really going to be really fascinating. Well, look, to look, me, you I'm, know. I'm very excited about it, to be You're honest. You're excited? Because, <laughs> yeah, well, listen, listen. I'm going to go out there, and I'm going to just continue where I left off. Yeah. You know? And if 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 if, if, we, if I go down in flames for that, then okay. If I die from it, then okay. You know? like, But this is the way that, that, that life is suggested to us is not okay for me. The, you the, know? the so, thing that uh, I have about it is that it might not be – the answer might just be rather mundane and boring. It might just be, oh, you just got turned away at security in the airport or, oh, you just can't buy that ticket yet or, oh, the venue is gone or, you know, like very simple mundane things all linked up together, which might make it very hard. I mean, my friend said to me, oh, you know, they could have, I don't know, open air gigs, but only sell 10% of tickets. And I said, you do realize that every ticket then will be 400 euro. 
you do realize exactly. that and she was like oh yeah. yeah i suppose so and right there's still expenses from the the town yeah you know? <laughs> i just i'm just a bit worried that the the mundanities of the situation are are going to be just like i mean in ireland i will say this and i think this is true of a lot of countries is that the finances are going to become so desperate that those are going to trump no pun intended the health and safety Dude, regulations you know since and that, when has since when has since when has finances in ireland ever gone well together in the same sentence <laughs> i mean it, you know we did I mean, all right for about a, 20 years and yeah, then we hey, kind hey, of blew it you still it. have a civil war going on yeah. you know well or, we we yeah, it's like there's, there's there's other things <laughs> you know like yeah. it i i don't think we could we can worry about things like this you know if it's if 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 we can't affect that I think we could just worry about the things that we can do, you know? Mm -hmm. So when I tell you that I'm excited, I'm excited because look at if, if, if our business gets downsized, so what? Like, at least it'll be exciting again. If anything, I was getting bored. I was getting bored going out to the same old metal festivals and seeing everything just completely safe. It's too safe. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it is. That's true. I agree with that. I I missed, I I missed out, you know, Night Demon wasn't a band in 1979, you know, like, like I didn't have the experience of the newness or, you know, I mean, maybe I want to go back to how I felt when I was 15 years old going to shows. It's a fair point. It's a fair point. I mean, I'm, and and look, listen, Alan, when I'm, when the next time I'm, I'm on stage and I look down and I see people in the mosh pit, like, you know, for a while, their moshing got so old for me. I just every time I looked down and saw somebody in the pit, I go, "Make sure to keep that guy away from me." When after after the show, like like you know, just like yeah, I don't like. I'm like, wow, man, we really still get these people at our shows. You know, I was hoping we had a little bit more of some sophisticated crowd, right? Now, <laughs> now my stance is, if I see somebody in the mosh pit, that's the most hardcore motherfucker. Who, you know, this guy, these people are afraid of nothing. They're willing, they're not talking about just social distancing. They're going to run into each other. They're going to sweat on each other. They're well, going to bleed it, on each other. It is an interesting um, analogy. Yeah, bring and back I, the danger in rock and roll, man. Yeah. You know? I, I hadn't really thought about it like that because I've been too busy, you know, kind of, uh, I suppose when you have the rug pulled up from under you completely as regards to live music, it takes a while to reorientate yourself. And then everything was just an invite to another fucking dreary, depressing acoustic right. acoustic version of our metal songs which i'm just <laughs> i want like no fucking part in forget it like that metallica oh. black and oh lads fucking stop please but it's just i got just got so <laughs> depressed that, that that the rock and roll was in the hands of just like gaming nerds you know but you yeah. are but, but you're right maybe it needs to go back to 89 or 92 or 94 when things at least i remember going to shows and they were dangerous they were kind of reckless you know I'm already starting. I just told somebody today. I'm I'm starting to take Saturdays. I'm taking Mondays off work, which is the, <laughs> the which is the day that nobody takes off. So I have Mondays off, and Saturdays are my. I'm getting rid of the digital leash. No phone. No computer. I'm oh, gonna yeah? turn it off and I'm gonna put it in a box. You know, I'm just gonna try it. I'm just gonna see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What that's like. Like I really, dude. It's crazy. You We're know, becoming cyborgs, man. Here. Yeah, yeah. The internet went out here the other day. Oh yeah. And and. The power went out at some point when this whole thing first started, and I'm like, okay, here we go. And I'm like, man, I'm sure glad I hung on all my DVDs and my CDs and my, <laughs> you know, and yeah. my LPs. So it's funny. I'm watching like some stuff, you know, '80s movies and television yeah, yeah. shows and sure, stuff. Yeah. And I'm just thinking, like, man, it's so crazy how these people. I just got so disconnected and forgot about how people did things then. Yeah, yeah. You know. Yeah. But it's just crazy to see a busy office and everybody and there's no computers. Yeah, I okay. can't. People are just like, you know, like yeah, like yeah. reading and writing and talking on the landline and stuff. Like, yeah, I mean, there, man. it is true. There's been lots of things that I can. I mean, I've you know, you can only walk around the city and see, wow, there's people out reading books. This is something I never would have seen three or Oof, four months ago. Yeah. You know, I mean, personally, I mean, I've just been doing I'm, lots of running all the time. You know, <laughs> right, right, right. Well, I mean, look. It's a, I mean, I hope people are doing that. I you know, think they are. Time, yeah. This this is a time where that and masturbating. <laughs> you know, this is a time where that happens because, I mean, where where it's a, where it's a good thing to do that. I think everybody should get reconnected. Like I read every day a real book, you mm, know, mm. and it's just it's so good for you, man. It's so it's just so great for your mind, and you know, uh, uh, 
the, the problem happening here in the States is like, th- you know, this, this quarantine time has gone really fast for a lot of people. It seemed really? to go slow for the first week or two. Right. And then before you know it, six to eight weeks is done and they have to go back to work and they're like, Whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute. I didn't, I didn't change my life yet. I didn't, I didn't oh, decide. Okay. To, yeah. I understand. You know, like, like, like I didn't expect it to end so soon. Like, because all these other jobs and schools are never going to come back this year. What happened? You know, and then, you know, I haven't decided who I am yet, right? Yeah, <laughs> and yeah. Then, I c- and I'm still the same lazy <laughs> piece of shit that I was before. Shit. That's sucks, interesting. You know? Yeah, it's the psychology right? of being given. It's like you've been giving this like little in, uh, extra summer holidays that you never but got. It's like this, man. This l- extra in America, break. You we know? don't get vacations. Okay? Yeah, yeah. So, so it's almost like your employer telling you, some of these people have been at companies for 10, 15 years that I know. Yeah, yeah. And your employer is telling you, you have to go home. You have no choice. We're laying you off. And we're actually locking you out of your emails, your accounts, all this shit, all mm. your contacts. Of course, right? yeah, yeah. And you are being forced to take a vacation indefinitely. We don't know how long it's going to be, yeah. but we're going to find a way to get you back, right? So it's a strange feeling just being open-ended and not knowing mm. like when it's going to come back and what it's going to be like when that is, right? So you kind of see the trends around you and you kind of get a good feeling of like, okay, well, looks like this is going to be lasting for a while yeah. and there's all this government <clears throat> stimulus, right? So like the thing that's happening right here is the unemployment is being paid to these people from the government, whether you've paid into it or not. And sure. it's a lot of money, dude. Like it's more money than these people are used to making. Right. So, so we're like sometimes some of it's double, it's double pay. Okay. Right. For okay. them to sit at home, and play video games, right? Yeah. So some people are Which some people this. are doing, yeah. Right. So what the government's doing, and it's actually, I think this is one smart move that they did, at least on their part, business-wise, right. is they're giving 0% loans to businesses, right? Right. But the businesses have to promise that they can't lay anybody off. Okay. So the government's giving 0% loans to businesses, but making sure that the that there are no layoffs and no recession. Yeah, it's like called furlough the, so, or something, yeah. Right, right, right. So then so the businesses are like, "Oh hell yeah." So they call their employees and go, "Hey, we're back. We're coming back next week. We're going to go we, do a slow rollout where it's just curbside pickup." I even know record stores that are doing curbside, okay? Really? So okay. it's like, "Oh yeah." So it's like, so we're doing this, right? And so you have a problem here because and <laughs> and listen, again, People, I guarantee you, the man or the powers that be saw this coming too. Okay, mm. so here's the, here's what you have. You have you have the employer going, "Hey, great news, guys! You know, I've managed to keep the business afloat. You know, I got a loan, and you know, the government took care of your unemployment while you were off, and we got to get back to work. And I've got your job secure. Let's do this. And and basically, you should be grateful that you have a job." And that I've kept my business going sure. and I'm here, right? Mm-hmm. And then the employee comes back saying, fuck, this is not a good – I never liked this job in the first place. Like I've had a taste of life without it. Now I'm going to go back for half the pay I'm used to getting. That I've okay, just right. I see what you nothing, mean. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But if I quit my job, I can't collect the benefits. Sure, you know? of course. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and the this company is... can't lay me off because – even if look at even if the company would be better off without an empl- a certain employee, right? Mm-hmm. Or you were friends with your boss, you they still cannot legally lay you off, or they don't qualify for the loan. Okay, yeah, it's like what so, we had in Ireland, like a welfare trap, where you have generations sure. of people who realize that the two or two hundred and fifty euro they get a week from the state, they're better off with that, and just then they can just do whatever they want, as opposed to you know, well, then do you no, any- absolutely, yeah, absolutely, yeah. so. Yeah, the system is it's really screwy because, you know, it's designed for certain people that make more money to be able to not be totally screwed. But the, the reality is most people getting the benefits are people that don't make much money. So, right, I see. Okay, that's interesting. So they, they, didn't, they didn't base it on your annual income. They just said across the board. Right. You know, so it's crazy, man. But, mm. you know, um, I will say that Everybody in my band and, and all the bands I manage, you know, I've signed up and qualified everybody for it. So there's like a thing for gig workers that just sure. started. So if you're a, if you're a musician or a stripper, 
know, <laughs> basically the government's giving you about eighteen to twenty thousand dollars from here to the end of the year. Wow, uh, our government. So that's bro- cool, but again, it's like you know the whole thing, dude. It's like they've been giving money to dead people, the stimulus checks and stuff. You know, they end up in people's accounts that aren't even alive anymore. Wow. Like they're just giving it away. And I, I, I had a friend who got uh, his his mother died, and he. And she died like right before this stuff happened. So he's still trying to sort things out. They haven't had a funeral and she still has her bank accounts open and he got a stimulus and he called, he called the hotline, the government hotline for the the stimulus hotline. And they explained to them what happened and, and they, they told him to keep the money. Wow. (laughs) Yeah, I said just keep it. But you got to think about this: who's real? Whose money is this really? Well, this I mean, the, it's the people's money. Yeah, and it's being mismanaged as always. So, you know, everybody can say what they want. Oh, Trump's a great businessman. He's just a bad uh, communicator, or whatever. But like, no, 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 he does bad business too. You know, so <laughs> it, all these guys do bad business. It's just, it's, it's insane, man. So, I mean, I don't watch much of the news, but it, you know, I'll go into a restaurant and pick up some food for takeout, and I could just, I could read the headlines on the screen. Like, yeah. Things like like there's no we have no hope or like, you know, like, you know, uh, nurse dies combating uh, treating coronavirus patient. Yeah, you know? Well, it's all it's that's one of the things that I've had to do in the last week is is I said it to some of my friends who were say they were very fatalistic about this whole thing. Let's say very catastrophic about it. And I sort of said to a few of them, like, you you should make sure you have some rowback room because I have a feeling that the, what's going to be rolled out is going to be kind of like a slow mundanity okay there might be depression there might be you know obviously financial problems but don't forget that this is not a run on the banks which is different to you say the 1920s or say the crash in 2008 so there is liquidity there is liquidity there but i just sort of said liquidity but they're just printing more money yeah of course yeah but i did just say to them like just make sure you have wiggle room to roll back from the end game like you know armed civil conflict and blah 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 blah, blah. um <laughs> well, you know because because everyone has to entertain that because let's be honest I, even i said to them like look the, uh, the the youtubers that you subscribe to even they are bound to the algorithm to give you a juicy headline like n- moderate like moderate man says reasonable thing no one reads that you know what i mean that gets well, no airtime so i'll tell you this you know you need you to I, I what i'm trying to say is that some people have just had to keep the volume your hand on the volume switch to be able to dial it back a little bit and i count myself among that you know but again and i tie this into rock and roll too it's like dude i was a rebellious youth you know rock and roll was everything for me and it still is and it, it's honestly it's been getting mundane and boring and i'm not saying just i'm not totally saying, there's been a lot of great music coming out the yeah. culture is getting sterile but yeah you know? i could agree i could agree that, with that yeah yeah so so musically i have no complaints i've been really liking a lot of stuff you yeah. know but mainstream but, heavy but, metal is very safe and boring that's what i don't oh, know yeah. dude i don't even yeah yeah we no, don't even need to talk about that yeah yeah no 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 but i mean you're gonna see a lot of you know there, there will be a lot of changes but I, i'm just i'm really excited to just be living in a time and feel alive you know i mean we're the first generation that never had to go to war ever in history ever think about that mm. ever well, I, it's it, still it's still it still might happen <laughs> well this may be it yeah know? it, it might saying. be it let's we can do this again in 6 months or 12 months and see if my i yeah. said to, I, earlier on i said if my if my uh, bunker apartment here is being used as a sort of as a sniper silo by you know sort of <laughs> by the green vest militants you know to fend off the city from a uh, you know armed uh, oligarchical bots or something then it might be a different podcast but i i tend to agree with you it has gotten very safe yeah i hadn't really thought about it like that before though you know yeah it's just this music used to mean something like the people need to bring a little bit more to this you know like there needs to be a bit more sacrifice and, and energy you know, maybe not, yeah but it needs to be about the music and the experience of the actual concert and the participation of the audience you know yeah. not not like drink more beer in the parking lot you yeah. know, <laughs> I, I, you I, know? T- yeah, I never I hadn't honestly until you laid it out like that. I hadn't really thought about it like that because I remember coming from a time when heavy metal did indeed mean danger and sacrifice, you know, yes. nailed on the ground. But it, it it is true. It has got a little, all a little bit corporate and complacent and safe. We you call know? it the pussification of America. Whenever something <laughs> happens, whenever something happens like um, 
hey, uh, uh, this, you know, somebody, fl- the tr- truck flipped over and somebody was in the back and they died. Okay, new legislature, that's never, that can't happen again. Having the, the government control is just, you know, I don't know. It's, it's nice to grow up in both eras, the pre-internet era and then the internet era. Oh, for era. sure. See, I'm so thankful that I was a teenager in the, in the 80s oh and 90s. Oh, my God. Yeah. Oh, my God. It's crazy. I think that we've lived through, in, in, in the history of mankind, at least as it sits right now, that we know about, this is, there's been more advancement in a, quick, in a shorter amount of time. Yeah than yeah. ever before and we, we've lived through that and it's kind of funny and i try and i don't want to lose the i don't want to sound like an old man but i don't want to lose some of those those core values and the things just like you said we were saying you know just cracking open a real book there's a psychology to it there's something that it does to your brain there's a certain connection that it makes you know or using pen and paper to write something mm, you gotta mm. you know you're bringing you're bringing your thoughts into the physical world when you do that yeah, you know for sure not on a keyboard not on your phone like make it real you know, it means it, these things used to mean something and they still do mean something. They have a deeper meaning and the powers that be that are telling us what to do. Trust me, they're not going to be doing that. They're going to be doing the things that I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. You know, they're not going to lose those traditions. They won't ever. But anyway, uh, you know, hey, look at I mean, yeah, let's wind such it up. Is eh? life, <laughs> such is life, man. It's good to be alive. You know, if you're not if you're not here, you, you're no you, you got nothing. <laughs> yeah, so. yeah. Well, no, I, 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 there's a few, a lot of stuff in there for me to unpack now that I hadn't really thought about before. You know, I've been busy, obviously, uh, erring on the side of uh, gloom and pessimism sometimes. But no, I, I think there's a few very, there's some very valid points in there. Definitely, I hadn't looked at it exactly like that, but it is true. I mean, dude, we could I'm do with a bit more sacrifice it. and danger, I, yeah, for sure. Yeah, dude, absolutely. And like, I'm just looking forward to that first day of going outside and 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 kickstarting the new world for rock you know all right <laughs> I, and i'm already working on it i mean i'm i'm gonna leave look it i'm gonna walk out of this door with an you're gonna see me with an eye patch from now on and i and i'll, <laughs> I'll still have both my eyes too i but you know this is like we're going we're going road warrior style here dude you know <laughs> all I'm right ready, dude so there you go there's the first guest on agitators anonymous young jarvis from night demon like I said, Instagram is primordial underscore Nemthianga. You can find me on Patreon at slash capital A, Alan, capital A, V E or I double L. Uh, and that's going to be it. This is on Acast, on Spotify. Please, if you can, subscribe, share, give me a rating, have a look on YouTube. There's going to be a few other videos and stuff up there. That's it. Till next time, metal never bends. Pentagram, dedicated to Henry Farmer. In the year of the primal war, to the dawn of terrestrial birth, man mastered the mammoth and horse, and man was the lord of the earth. He made him an oil skin from the heart of a holy tree. He compassed the earth therein, and man was the lord of the sea. He controlled the vigorous steam, he harnessed the lightning for hire, he drove the celestial team, and man was the